Thank you, Wei. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is going to be Francesco Marchetti. Um, Francesco is a professor at the Environmental Health Center that's part of uh, Health Canada, located in Ottawa. And research conducted in the Environmental Health Center aims at implementing novel methods to evaluate the potential hazards posed by um, chemicals on the uh, genetic integrity of germ cells. And today, Francesco is going to present a talk entitled The Legacy of Paternal Exposure to Toxicants More Than Just Gene Mutations. Francesco, the uh, Hi. screen is yours. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for the, for the nice invitation. Uh, and also thank you to the organizer for the opportunity to present uh, at this fabulous conference. And so this, this uh, invitation gives me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work that we are conducting at um, uh, Health Canada on assessing the impact of the environment on, on germ cells. And uh, I feel that I have to start uh, uh, my presentation with a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is that uh, I will not present any data on epigenetic effects. However, in line with the name of the conference, one goal of my presentation today is to make the point that if we really want to fully understand the impact of the environment on the germ cells and the, and the consequences for the health of the offspring, we really need to take a, a holistic view of our genome and not just focusing on that 2% of it that is composed by, by genes. So when we're talking about uh, heritable genetic disease, there is a fundamental difference with respect to when we are talking about mutations in somatic cells. And that is that for somatic cells, the adverse outcome is inevitably cancer. But when we're talking about her heritable genetic disease, we are talking to a broad spectrum of uh, uh, diseases that can take place. And the other point that I want to make is that uh, uh, outside of the field of scientists who deal with, uh, are familiar with germ cells and reproduction, it's not uh, appreciated the fact that the genetic defects in human reproduction are actually quite common. They are not rare by any means. And uh, there are many defects that impact human reproduction. And for example, if we look at the human gene, uh, gene mutation database, uh, at my last check, there are now over 275,000 different genetic alterations that have been associated with inherited disease. And when you look at the types of alterations that you find, you find anything going from a changes, the change in a single base to large rearrangements and complex uh, rearrangements of the chromosomes. In addition, uh, the majority of these uh, genetic alterations are de novo, meaning that they are present in the child, but they are not present in the parents. And although this database doesn't provide information on the causes of these uh, alteration, it would be really astonishing to think that none of these alterations are due to an, an environmental exposure, but they're all due to random errors during the replication. And uh, to go back to the point I was making here, to, that uh, mutations in germ cells affect uh, many diseases, just to give you an example, here there is a study that demonstrated that when you're looking at children with, with intellectual uh, disorders, uh, one in 2,500 kids is born with a mutation that affects uh, um, their de developmental disorder. 
And to make the point again, this is a, a, a recent study just published by um, Aaron Quinlan in Utah, making the very interesting observation that if you look at the germ mutation rate in young adults, it's associated with uh, uh, reproductive lifespan and longevity with children having a higher germline mutation rate tending to have a reduced uh, reproductive lifespan and longevity, making again the case that G mutations in germ cells can affect a broad uh, spectrum of function and uh, health uh, outcome. To make the point that uh, uh, looking at just genes is very reductive, uh, I want to uh, show this um, uh, graphic representation coming again for a very recent review uh, that shows that our genome is composed by many functional units and all these functional units are important to make sure that uh, uh, our genes function uh, uh, properly. And uh, with more uh, data coming out, it's becoming uh, more evident that uh, change, genetic changes in any of these regions can result in uh, genetic diseases. And here is just a list of genetic changes in any of these functional regions of the genomes that have been observed in inherited diseases. And you can see you can go from splicing abnormalities to intron retention, intron deletions, uh, mutations in uh, UTR regions in promoter, in enhancer, uh, duplications and deletions of promoters. So that again, if we really want to understand uh, how our environment impacts uh, health, we need to look uh, at the genome as a functional unit and not just focus on genes. So my research has been focused on uh, um, identifying the chemicals in the environment that affects germ cells. And the white, white elephant in our field is whether human germ cell mutagens do exist, whether they represent science and uh, or fiction. And this is a, a, <clears throat> it's a, an interesting uh, debate because when we look at um, the data available in laboratory um, animals, there are at least 85 agents that are established germ cell mutagens. And in addition, there may be 80 or more additional chemicals that have some limited evidence that they can affect uh, the germ cell. Furthermore, over a third of the chemicals that are established uh, uh, rodent germ cell mutagens they also have data demonstrating an increase in genetic defects in the offspring of the exposed male. So not only do they affect the germ cells of the exposed animal, but the genetic constitution of the offspring. And yet, we still don't have a widely accepted human germ cell mutagen. And in, and in this paper that uh, we published uh, in um, when uh, to celebrate the 50th years of the environmental mutagenesis, mutagenesis and genomic society, uh, we went through all the available data and we asked the question, is it real, really realistic to think that none of the rodent germ cell mutagens have the same characteristic when humans are exposed to them? And uh, I would ask Steve Martin to give uh, what he thinks, and I'm happy to see that uh, he agrees with me that it's really unlikely that uh, there are no human germ cell mutagens. And as David De Marini uh, already presented to this conference in his keynote presentation during session one, if you look, for example, at these four agents listed on the slide, and you look at the available data in animal models and in humans, and you conduct a higher IARC style assessment, 
you can already conclude that you have enough evidence to say that these four agents can be considered uh, human germ cell mutagens. So I think we can go past uh, the question of whether germ cell mutagens exist or not, because they do exist. And the current notion to the contrary is actually not grounded in, fa in facts. And what they me are missing are definite data demonstrating an increase in the novel mutation in the offspring of exposed parents. And even on this second topic, you can actually make uh, a counter -argu argument that we already, <clears throat> excuse me, we already have this evidence. And this one is coming from the studies of Yuri Dubrova at Leicester in England. In, and uh, Yuri and his group uh, over a decade or so provided convincing evidence that uh, the mini satellite mutation rates are increased in the children of families that were exposed to radiation because of the Chernobyl accident. However, uh, this data has been pretty much ignored and I'm showing here the statement coming from the Bayer 7 report that is the Bible for the effects of ionizing radiation in the human population. <clears throat> and as you can see, they state that apart for, from the evidence that the mutational events represents non-targeted genes, so they're not important, no real insights have emerged on the mechanism of uh, uh, induced instability. And because of these reasons and the fact that these mutations events are happening in regions that are not protein coding regions, we can ignore them and we don't have to consider them when we are estimating the risk of exposure to ionizing radiation. Um, the Bayer 7 was published in 2005 and there is rumor that the Bayer 8 is in the works and I sincerely hope that as they reevaluate this data in light of what we have learned, they would really change this statement and consider changes in non-genetic genic regions as, is, as important as changes in genic regions. In addition, I hope they will consider that we are in the midst of a paradigm shift in a sense that traditional germ, germ cell tests, they were looking at a single gene and you needed to look at thousands of individuals to find a mutation. It's like in a very world of type of, of study. And now with next generation sequencing, we have shifted that paradigm. Now we can look at uh, thousands of genes and in few individuals. Furthermore, while the traditional germ cell tests that we were using for animal studies were not applicable to humans, these new next generation sequencing now, they are equally applicable to, to humans and, and laboratory, uh, laboratory animals. And in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you the data that it's coming out of applying next generation sequencing to the question of whether there are environmental exposure that increase the burden of mutation in the offspring. And the first study, study is also coming from Yuri Dubrova, uh, uh, Dubrova's group, and they demonstrated that when they irradiated mice to ionizing radiation and then they let them mate and look at the offspring, they could see a significant increase in the number of copy, uh, copy number variants in the, in the offspring of exposed animals, and that those copy number variants tended to affect larger uh, sections of the, of the genome. They also found a significant increase in indels. However, when they were looking at single base substitutions, they could not see a significant increase in the offspring of irradiated animals. Although there was a sign of ionizing radiation exposure because the number of clustered mutations were increased in the, in the offspring of irradiated mice. Another group in Japan 
demonstrated that when you're using a strong mutagens like ENU, you can just focus on the exomes and you can detect a dose related increase in mutations in the exomic regions of the offspring. And uh, here the two bars just refer to having used two different approaches to identify mutation. What we have done at the Health Canada is to conduct a large study using uh, a very common environmental pollutant called the benzoipyrene that can be found uh, in uh, air pollution, in tobacco smoking, uh, car exhaust, but also when you barbecue in uh, red meat. And we wanted to ask a couple of questions. The first one was, can we detect an increase in the novel mutations in the offspring of mice or male mice that were treated with benzoepirine. And for this arm of the study, we mated mice uh, from our model, and I will tell you a little bit later what the mutant mouse model is, uh, to benzoepirine, and then we mated them either three days after the end of exposure to look at postmeiotic effects, or 42 days after the end of, my, of exposure to look at my uh, premiotic effects. And then we analyzed the offspring for either copy of number variants or single nucleotide variants. At the same time, another arm of the study, we analyzed the sperm of mice that were treated in the same way, and we conducted, conducted a series of tests to look at the Mutations, mutations in the sperm, and we really wanted then to compare whether what we were seeing in sperm was reflected in what we were seeing in the offspring of exposed male. And so what did we find? Uh, in the first study, we looked at uh, mutations on microsatellites in the sperm of uh, uh, benzoepirine treated males, and we used two different loci. And you can see that uh, the two loci have different rates of spontaneous mutations, but in both cases, we were able to see a significant increase in the number of microsatellite mutations uh, when the mice were exposed to um, benzopyrene. When we looked in the offspring, we saw a significant increase in the number of duplication uh, events in the offspring of uh, uh, mice exposed to uh, benzoepirene. And, uh, and, and uh, we had concordance between what we observed in the sperm versus what we observed in the offspring. We then looked at mutations and in sperm we used the muta mouse, which is a transgenic mouse that contains a Luxad reporter gene that we can use to measure mutation. And what we found in the sperm of the uh, exposed males was what we expected. When we looked at three days after the end of exposure and we were studying what happened in spermatids, we did not see an effect of the exposure. And that is because to detect a mutation, you need to have DNA replications and spermatids do not have DNA replications nor divide. And so there is not a chance for the benzoepirene adduct to be converted into a mutation that we can measure. However, when we looked at the impact on spermatogonia, we found a significant increase in mutation, a dose-related increase, and that effect was still present when we looked past 70 days after the end of mutations, when we were focusing on, on effects induced in stem cells. When we then looked in the offspring, again, we saw a significant increase in mutations in the offspring of mice exposed to benzoepirene. And furthermore, we were able to discriminate between what we call the novel mutations that were present in every cell of the offspring, indicating that it was already present in the sperm of fertilization, and what we call embryonic events that were happening at frequencies suggesting that they were not present in every cell of the body, but that they had originated post-fertilization, and therefore these mice were mosaic for, the, for this mutation. 
But again, overall, there was concordance between the resulting sperm and the result in the offspring. We then looked at the number of the types of mutations, and we, when we analyzed the type of mutation in sperm, we found that the benzofirine induced mostly mutation at one in, and the same pattern was found in, uh, in the offspring. And what was very interesting is that uh, we analyzed up to three mice per liter, and quite often we found a significant variation in the number of mutations among those three mice coming from the same litter. And when we were focusing on, on the mice with the high number of mutations that we find that we, that we call affected, they had strongly the same signature that we found in sperm. So summarizing the results of this experiment, we found that uh, mutations in, were in sperm, both on microsatellite sites, but also point mutations. We had the same uh, results in the offspring and the implication is that this set of empirical data support that if you have mutations in sperm you're going to have those mutations transmitted to the next generation. I now want to shift to what uh, we know about human uh, families and what has been done with next, next generation sequencing in human families and I want to start from this uh, study in, in 2012, which was really groundbreaking coming out of Carrie Stephenson and the DECODE uh, study in Iceland, Iceland, in which they demonstrated that uh, this very strong paternal age effect for the induction of mutation or the novel mutation in the offspring. In this case, they were looking at a cohort of families with autistic, or uh, children, and thus the, there was the question of whether this increase in uh, mutation with paternal age was specific to this, this cohort or it was general, generalizable to the uh, human population. And after this study, many other studies came, came out demonstrated that this is actually a characteristic of normal population. And here, for example, it's a study done in Denmark in which they demonstrated again this very strong paternal age effect. The older is the father are conception of their child, the higher is the number of mutation that are present in, in, in the children. And what was also very intriguing that in this study, they also demonstrated a, a weaker but unmistakable maternal age effect which is surprising because as I mentioned to you, you really need the replication to induce mutation and the proliferate phase of oogenesis is completed by, by birth. So it's a little bit uh, uh, puzzling why we see this one, this increase, this maternal age effect. But what these and other people were able to demonstrate is that uh, these mutations associated with maternal age have a signature of DNA damage, which point potentially to an environmental exposure. And when you put all the studies together, we have now an estimate that the father contributes 1.2 mutation per year of age to the child and the mother 0.4 mutation per year of age. All the studies that I just presented were all conducted in trios. And there are now several examples of, of studies in which we have you looked at human families with multiple children. And here it's the first study that was published in 2015 by uh, Matt Hurls, in which they looked at three families with four children. And now you start to, you start to see something very interesting. And it is the fact that, yes, you do see a paternal age effect in all families, but now the steepness of the increase is different. And this one now we have, we have much more due to this uh, incredible study, again, coming out from Aaron Quinlan group in Utah, in which they analyzed 33 Mormon families with many children in each family. 
And to me, it's really astonishing the fact that every single family, they were able to detect a paternal and increasing mutations, a function of paternal age. And the other important point is that when you rank those families based on the number of mutations, you really see some families where the paternal age, it's really small, less than 0.5 mutations per year, up to more than three mutations per year. And now you start asking the question, what is driving this variation? Is it genetic or is it environmental? Unbeknown to us that Aaron was getting ready to publish this study, we started a similar study with uh, a group in the United States that they were actually interested in Mendelian transmission of mutations. And we said, well, we are very interested in what you throw out. We are interested in non-Mendelian transmission. So would you like to collaborate? And so we established a collaboration with Nicole Alvarez at Wake Forest. And we were very interested in collaborating with them because one, they have 17 of these very large human families, both, most of them with multiple children. And not only that, but they had already sequ sequenced a lot of genomes. So all we had to do was to pick some of these families and look at the sequence data that was available. And in, in an initial pilot study, we selected 14 of these subfamilies and we looked at the mutations in the, in the child, children as a function of paternal age. And what we found again, a consistent paternal age effects. Every family, there was this trend for more mutations in the children as the parents age. We did find, and actually I was happy to see because I couldn't believe that uh, there was not a family that was outside this pattern. And we actually have one example of the opposite effect. Here is a family where actually the number of mutations go down as paternal age. But if you look at the age of the father, this was a family where the, the father was barely 16 years old. And he was even known yet 22 years old at the fourth child. And fortunately for him, he didn't have another child but I would have been very interested if he had a child when he was 30 and 40, whether we would have seen a similar uh, increase in mutation. And the other interesting point coming out from this study was that when we looked at the two families with the steepest increase, the fathers in these two families are brothers. So again, pointing either to a genetic uh, uh, determinants of the mutation rate or to a common environmental exposure of the of this rate. And quickly, uh, as we were expected, when we looked at where these mutations are happening, they are happening everywhere. Only a small portion is affecting gene, but as I've been telling you, we now have more and more evidence that mutation in any of these genomic regions are important. And also, when we also we just focus on the coding regions, we see that the majority of these mutations are detrimental. And so you would expect an adverse consequence for the outcome for the child. And so in concluding, what we know for the moment in human families is that multiple studies using families with multiple children show this consistent increase in the novel mutation across families. However, they also show significant variation. And the three studies I was presenting, you can see that if you look at the larger studies, the rate of, the, of increase per year may change by tenfold or more among these sets of families. And that really poses a problem for the quest to look for germ cell mut mutations in human families, because obviously, we are looking at an environmental impact that's maybe 50%. Even I can give you a twofold increase with respect to background. But when the background, it's already the variation in the background is this large, it means that probably we need to look uh, at a large number of families to pick up an environmentally related increase in mutation. So I want to just close by saying that uh, the quest for human germ cell mutagen is continuous, but it definitely will involve 
uh, large collaborations involving scientists from many different uh, fields, uh, uh, genomics experts. If we were going to be really critical to properly characterize the exposure of these families, we need uh, the uh, involvement of clinicians uh, and so on. But the goal is, the, the more than the goal, uh, the hope is that harnessing these genomic technologies, we can really define uh, environmental exposure and the impact, characterize the health implication, improve risk assessment, and equally important will be to communicate better the risk of having human germ cell uh, mutagens and how to manage and mitigate their impact. And as I was completing this uh, presentation, it hit me that this slide is actually very much applicable to epigenetics and you can make a simple, a simple change. And again, this is also what the epigenetic field is facing. And finally, I want to uh, acknowledge the collaborators on this project. First and foremost, Carol Yock, who is, has been my collaborator for even from before I moved to Health Canada. And this collaboration will continue even now that she has moved to the University of Ottawa. Uh, present and past members of, uh, of our groups. Uh, Nicole Hal Alred at Wake Forest and uh, Matt Hurls and his group uh, at uh, uh, the Sanger Institute. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. Um, while we wait to see if, if questions arise, um, I, I had one. So I know you said that you wouldn't talk about epigenetics uh, and epigenetic mechanism in your um, disclaimer. But um, considering the fact that there's increasing evidence showing that epigenetic enzymes and that chromatin structure uh, participates in uh, DNA repair processes, um, could it be possible that genetic mutations could arise from um, epigenetic mechanism and that that could be a link between the environment and the uh, mutations? Oh yeah, that's a, it's a very good point. It is certainly certainly possible. Um, how you gonna about discriminating between, let's say, a direct effect from an indirect effect is gonna be more challenging. Uh, but for sure, as work that uh, I didn't have the time to go into it is also because I'm not the main uh, um, scientist on the project, but I've been collaborating with Amanda McFarlane here at Health Canada, and she's very interested in the effect of folate. And we have been looking at the effect of folate diet status on the level of mutations that we are detecting uh, both in the exposed individual and in the offspring. And, and we certainly see that uh, you may impact uh, mutagenesis by modulating the amount of folate that mm -hmm. uh, the mouse is experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, I think Jill had a question. I don't know if you want to ask yourself, Jill. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I, I think I'll pass. I was just going to, to kind of prod the question about how all of this research is done in sperm and how eggs are so sadly overlooked. And I was gonna ask Francesca what we can do to put eggs you know, back in the spotlight. I know it's hard, but um, we don't have a lot of time. Maybe if you have like 20 seconds, then we'll move on. Well, the, 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 you, know, you know better than me, the problem is that uh, you, know, you can get only a limited number of eggs that you can, you can study, and that makes it uh, almost impossible to do these types of studies. Uh, we are confident, I mean, we are fully understand that this is a gap and research gap that needs to be filled. And there are new technologies down the road that some of the error corrected correct sequencing approaches or single cell sequencing that provides the hope that we will be able also to uh, look at uh, female germ cells. Thank you. Okay, moving Thank you, on. Francesca. Thank you so much, Francesca.